hello everyone. I'm Angela DeBarger. I'm a program officer at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and I've been at the foundation now a year and a half. And as I've been learning about the work in open education, I'm always, always curious about how the field is evolving globally, and particularly research around teaching and learning. So as I, as I was reflecting on this, um, I thought it could be useful not only for the purpose of the foundation, but also for the field to conduct a landscape analysis, to look at what we're learning across the world and in different regions, and uh, to share that back to help to spark a conversation um, and be part of the conversation about the future of the open education field. My colleague Kathy Casserly has led this work in collaboration with uh, colleagues at Redstone Strategy Group. And um, she, she's been a wonderful partner and colleague in this work and across my other work at the foundation. And I'm going to turn it over to Kathy, who's going to begin by um, sharing some highlights from the research. And then I'll um, share some reflections um, about the implications for the field. So thank you, and good to see you after lunch. Hopefully, we're all still awake. Um, just actually before I dig in a little bit on the research, we're, uh, we'll share a, a link at the end which will actually connect you to the full deck. So we're going to be seeing kind of a sampling of the research so you have a sense of what kind of data was collected and what might be useful to you. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, this uh, research was conducted in six months from uh, the fall and was completed in February, so it was a relatively quick scan. It was not known, it wasn't attempted to be a comprehensive research landscape, but looking more at recent trends about what is the field producing in the research area, what are the themes, what are the methodologies, what are we beginning to see. And the, re, and the pieces that we looked at were not only research pieces, they were also thought pieces and they were also policy pieces. What is influential in the field? What are people pointing to? And we used a number of technology of ways to gather data. We identified experts uh, who are known in the field. We interviewed them in depth. We asked them to reference research that they thought was important. We asked. We also looked at some of the databases like the OER Research Hub, RAWFD, and other um, areas as well. I also want to point out that the research was limited to the researchers, myself and an analyst being English language dependent. And so we didn't have the capacity to analyze research in other languages. So I want to call this out right now because it's clearly a bias that gets introduced to the pieces that are collected. At the same time, we were very intentional of looking for research across regions and highlighting research across regions. The work itself is outside the U.S. base. So the idea here was to look really at non-specific U.S. based research and what was uh, being analyzed and the analysis happening overall. So with that, I'll share some of the findings overall. So um, pretty much obviously at a high level, the research believe it's much more robust in North America and Europe. Uh, certainly if you've been in the field, you're aware of this. If you're new to the research, you're, you can um, point this out. And the caveat that the English language is skewed. So not only ourselves as researchers, but other experts we spoke to indicated this kind of hesitancy about identifying key articles at times because they themselves may not have had English language. I should also say that some of the experts we spoke to were multilingual and were able to point us to um, articles as well. But as we look at the research, we can also see that the focus of the research tends to differ. Now, these are relative generalizations that we see, but it does differ across the, the, the world, the globe, and what the focus is and what the areas of key interest. So in North America, a lot of focus on costs and perceptions, a lot coming out of Europe around the open pedagogy and what it means in the open access. In Asia, re reusable learning objects and the cost benefit for universities. And so again, Africa, teacher education. So you can begin to see some of the trends that are happening. There were some pieces of research that were multi-regional. And I really want to call out two pieces that everyone really pointed to as key pieces that are becoming exemplar for the field to point to at this point in time. One is the work on the Global South conducted by University of Cape Town and the Roar for D and all the researchers who participated in that. That was really called out as an exemplary piece that we can all learn from. And also the more recent work from Cronin, from Catherine, who's, who was here, I think she's somewhere else right now, and McLaren on conceptualizing OEP, another piece that people are pointing to is really moving the field ahead. 
One thing we did is we also made sure to call out a selection of articles from each region. This slide isn't meant for you to be able to read, but just to point out that we've identified some research that you can come and go back to when you look at the full deck to be sure that you're finding pieces that are representative of all parts of the globe. And in addition, we also highlighted about 10 to 15 articles that really were kind of standing out as represent representative, that were people were calling out that were important for the field overall, and providing a bit of an analysis for people who are relatively new to the research area to begin to dig in and see what the trends are and what some of the more important pieces that are coming out overall. The much, so we, we analyzed about a collection of about 150 articles, um, this N is 126. The majority of the articles were about higher education, um, and yet, at the same time, if you look at some of the bullets on the right-hand side, there are some caveats about that. Certainly, the, the multi-regional and the global studies are, more, are both about primary, secondary, and higher education. Europe also skewed more heavily. And if you look into the research piece itself, we divide this analysis by regions. When you look at Central America, 50% of those articles include more primary, secondary studies. So again, the work is focused in different ways across the globe. And that in some samples, that the regions were just small n, so we have to be careful about how we think about the representation. Most research explores multiple topics. And so what we did is we coded the uh, research database dependent on where the areas of focus were. So if you you won't be surprised, perhaps, to see in knowing uh, where the field has been a lot of focus on adoption and discoverability, which also now coming close second or tied with it is the open teaching and the practices and the pedagogy. This work on the perceptions of OER, more of that came out of North America. I think we'll see less of that as the field begins to develop. And then certainly the pieces I think that many of us are most interested in around stu student learning outcomes, which is difficult to measure and capture. Um, and student uses of OER, which I certainly called out, was called out in the past few days here at the conference. There was mixed use methodologies overall. Um, again, um, sometimes employing multiple methodologies, but again, this begins to call out just the general themes and directions we're seeing with the types of research that are being uh, conducted. So most pieces did have desk research or literature review included, as well as the qualitative uh, case studies or the qualitative interviews. There was some opinion and perception uh, surveys conducted as well. Uh, but the work on the quantitative side, the observational data with statistical controls or without statistical controls, as you can see, is very, very limited. And this is a piece that we may want to see more robust in the future if we feel it can kind of give us the evidence base we need to really understand what's happening in the field. We did not find any randomized experiments, which we wouldn't be perhaps surprised given the, the norms of the, of the field overall. So let me just point out a few opportunities to capitalize on for stronger methodologies and kind of the rising areas with the trends of what we saw. So one, one kind of caveat or caution is that there's really limited generalizability to institutional scale. And I think this actually t points back to the opening keynote because the issues around sustainability and institutional scale, we have a lot of studies that are more classroom based. It does share a lot of information. It is critically important. And yet, at the same time, to understand how to really scale this up to get institutions to buy in, to see the value, uh, we're not quite there. There's been a positive shift that we would say in, in design in calling it research rigor loosely in the last few years where the methodologies are stronger. And again, I think this is what we see in the emergence of a field as more researchers um, convene, learn with each other, and share overall. The field is really obviously intersect, intersecting with other open fields, so it's, real, it's not a pure study. These research articles were open edu OER, open pedagogy. Some of them were MOOCs or digital pedagogy as we were looking at different regions. A lot of conversations, particularly with the experts and with other researchers, about the blends, and that we can learn from some of the metrics perhaps they've used in some of these adjacent fields. And lastly, the research in the Global South has been historically, as we all know, less developed. And it merits effort to certainly raise the profile uh, in the Global North. But we have to be careful to preserve, obviously, the local questions overall. So with that, let me turn it over to Angela. So 
one thing that was interesting um, as the team was synthesizing um, what we were hearing from the different uh, people that we spoke to, the different users actually value and need um, different kinds of research. Um, thought leaders and field conveners really um, valued and appreciated research that helps give them a sense of where the field is headed next and what's reasonable and to, to, to expect in terms of um, where they can push and, and support the field in, in going forward. Policy advocates uh, wanted the headlines um, about uh, what's working, um, how were programs funded, how and in what ways, you know, briefly, you know, how and in what ways these programs were, were supported. And then for program implementers, it was really um, more about uh, figuring out the grounded guidelines to help them inform how to implement uh, programs. So this process is not so surprising, but just a reminder that um, in doing our research, thinking from the very beginning, what's the purpose, um, who are the audiences that we hope to connect with, um, particularly if we're, um, one of the goals is to expand and connect with new communities of practice. Um, another finding or synthesis from a takeaway is that there are a few areas that surfaced as high priority um, needs in terms of next steps for research. These have to do with teaching and learning, policy and practice connections, and then taking on more um, intentional uh, implementation research. So just taking on uh, the t questions around teaching and learning, um, some of the uh, field experts voiced a question around the need for additional rigorous research to help validate the relationships between the impact of OER on student learning and engagement. And I want to just unpack that a little bit and acknowledge I, I believe there's rigor both in uh, case studies as well as these larger kind of studies. So it's not just about the size of the studies. And in fact, we were just at a, a really beautiful session prior to this where we talked about the discipline in creating small stories. Um, I think part of what the push here is around is making the connections between that work and, and um, how we uh, demonstrate student learning, not just a learning around the academic disciplines, but also social and emotional growth. Um, really pleased to see the growth in the field around the connections between OER and teaching practices and continuing this work that helps us understand how and in what ways it matters when materials are openly licensed and how that benefits um, teaching and learning. And then finally, this last question, I think, starts to get at um, a need to um, continue research and work that helps us understand how to apply inclusive design. And really from the very beginning, so that we're not retrofitting courses to meet the needs of every learner, but, um, but more inclusive from the start. In terms of policy and practice, here's where it, it, we can't continue to, or, or can't be satisfied with just tracking the number of open policies, but really understanding um, what happens when policy is taken up and used. Um, so in places where there are open policies, looking to, and tracking adoption rates of OER, exploring the potential for increasing adoption of OER within and beyond these contexts. I think there's an interesting opportunity to explore the connection between pol open policy and open practice. Where are there um, cases where open educational practices are explicitly addressed in policy? And I think vice versa, where are we seeing grassroots take up of open educational practice and that's um, beginning to shift policies in, in institutions? Then finally, like getting at the mechanism for how this work can be done. So for example, um, when governments and institutions um, adopt, agree to adopt OER, how are they changing procurement and financing? How can we understand how this is happening in different countries, in different institutions? Share that out so that we can all continue to, um, to learn and, and grow and perhaps adopt these kinds of practices more regularly. Um, I'm going to go a bit quickly through the next set um, so that we can leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, I think uh, what I'd highlight here um, are a couple things. 
um, one, it would be really important to look at where we have seen success and long-term success of OER projects. Understanding what are the policies and people in those places that are enabling this work to continue on even after funding has concluded. Um, and um, developing research agendas that aren't just about building theory but really have practical utility for educators and students. Um, engaging like continuous improvement cycles so that there's a lot of interaction and exchange about what's working, um, how it's working, um, and iteratively refining the approach along the way. I guess the last point I would make about technology um, uh, is that um, as the fields between open education and uh, educational technology continue to evolve and perhaps intermingle, um, making sure that we are able to develop strong evidence-based arguments um, to advance the ethical use of data and technology with open education. Um, okay, uh, I think I'm going to share that this is something that I'm working on as part of and, and taking in this data to inform our strategy at the Hewlett Foundation around open education. Um, and love to talk with any of you um, after this or on Twitter about it. I'll continue to update the field about how the strategy is evolving. And um, want to just highlight a couple of resources that are available. Um, uh, we are. We would invite you to um, part to share and to learn from the research that we've collected and used as part of our work. Um, and so this is available um, online. Um, and uh, the full study and findings are available on the Hewlett website. So please take a look at those and um, send us your feedback. Great. Thank you. So um, we do have time for a couple of questions or comments, if anybody would like to say anything or ask anything. No? Would, then I'll pass back. Is there one? Okay. There's one in the middle there. Yeah, I'll just make a comment while the microphone goes up. So the first, the tiny URL is the database of the research we collected with all the fields. And it, it's just, you know, it's not a complete comprehensive set. What we learned is everyone has their own collection on their desktop, and we wanted to create a place where we can actually all contribute. So if you would like to share your research articles, at a point, it's very easy. It'll take you five minutes to upload your data as well, and other people can go and discover it in a much, I think, easier fashion. Great. Hi, I just had a question related to um, Sue's talk this morning. So when she talked, um, she talked uh, of, a, of a paradigm that's very kind of dangerous where we put things into spreadsheets and we count things and we, we have a very positive mindset, positivist mindset. Uh, and when I hear we need more rigor, we need more control, I start to hear we need more numbers and, we, and, and getting kind of away from qualitative. So how are you, how are you seeking ways to kind of balance um, the need for, as you say, the scalable uh, with the need for the human element? That's a really great question. Um, uh, didn't mean, no, was there not an intention to imply that this, these kinds of quantitative studies are more valuable than qualitative? They don't um, give us the information they need. I think part of what I'd like to figure out um, through the strategy refresh is to find that complementary set of, or think about the complementary set of um, studies and methodologies that um, are mutually beneficial to helping us learn about our strategic direction that we set and, and the field. So I think it's going to be a both and kind of approach. That's, that's how I think about it. Do you add anything yeah. to that? I'm afraid the last word has to come from Kathleen, and then we'll have to move on. So if you have other questions, can you hold them for, for the tea break? Do you want to just make a concluding uh, um, well, you know, and I was just going to conclude, I think, as the work moves more into practice, I think it's naturally going to be more qualitative in nature, but as we still want to think about system implementation and sustainability, there's an interest in understanding how that can work as well. So I think, I don't think it's um, one or the other to amplify Angela's comments as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Yes. Thank you.